So let's talk about cryptography. As always, we'll define some terms, and in this case, let's consider a scenario where Alice wants to send a private message to Bob. So Alice will have her plain text, which is just the message in readable format. Let's just assume this is an email that she's sending. So the plain text is just the original text of the email. Alice will use her encryption key, K sub A here, and run that through an encryption algorithm. And out of the other end of that encryption algorithm, we'll get something called ciphertext. Now, ciphertext is the encrypted version of the plain text. So, whereas if I got a hold of the plain text message, I could just read it. If I get the ciphertext, it's just going to look like gibberish, right? This is the version that I, as someone who's not supposed to see this stuff, isn't going to be able to read. Now, Alice will send that ciphertext through her communication channel to Bob's decryption algorithm. And Bob's decryption key, K sub B, will be used with his decryption algorithm to process that ciphertext, and out of the other end comes plain text that Bob can read. As always, we've got to be concerned with the idea that maybe Trudy's out there listening to that communication channel and trying to steal that ciphertext. So when we start talking about cryptography, we're going to be using some mathematical terms as well. So let's talk about what these variables mean. M will just be our plain text message. K sub A of M is the ciphertext encrypted with key A. So when we talk about this stuff, we're going to say K sub A of M is going to indicate the ciphertext that Alice has encrypted with her key K sub A. So we can get the original message back at Bob's end by applying K sub A of M, then using that as an input to apply K sub B of M. All that means is that if I have an encrypted message that's been encrypted with Alice's key, I can now use Bob's key, K sub B, to get the original message back. So basically, we use Alice's key to create the ciphertext and Bob's key to undo that encryption and get the original plain text back. So how might Trudy go about trying to break the encryption that Alice and Bob are using? Well, she has a couple different options. There's a ciphertext only attack in which Trudy just has ciphertext that she can analyze. So she was listening in on that communication channel and she managed to snag that traffic, snag the message between Alice and Bob, but it's in its encrypted form. All she has is the ciphertext. She could take two approaches to this. She could either brute force the encryption, which just means search through every possible key until you hit the right one. Or she might use something called statistical analysis, where she might apply some mathematical tricks to see if she can't break this thing. Another option is a known plain text attack. This assumes that Trudy has plain text corresponding to the ciphertext. So, for example, in a monoalphabetic cipher, which we'll cover in a couple slides, Trudy might determine the pairings for the letters A, L, I, C, E, B, O, and that could give her a start at figuring out what letters have been used to replace those letters, which she could then work from to try to decrypt the entire message. She could also use a chosen plain text attack, where Trudy can get ciphertext for a chosen piece of plain text. So maybe Trudy has managed to figure out that a certain plain text email message that she's managed to get a hold of corresponds to an encrypted email message that she also has. She could then use those in combination to try to figure out the encryption scheme and how to break it. Now that we've talked about the general idea behind encryption decryption and some of the ways that we might break encryption, let's start getting more specific and talk about something called symmetric key cryptography. In symmetric key cryptography, Bob and Alice would share the same key K sub S. That's why it's called symmetric. Both sides have the same thing. Now, rather than a K sub A at Alice's end and a K sub B at Bob's end, they both just have one key that can be used for both encryption and decryption. The question is, how are Bob and Alice going to agree on a key value? Now, that's simple enough if they can meet in person and just hand the key to each other. But what happens when Bob and Alice are on opposite ends of the world? What happens when we're talking about a browser on your laptop 
and the web server that's who knows where that you want to talk to. The reason I use that example is because actually in HTTPS, right, where we browse the web using SSL to encrypt our messages, we actually use symmetric key encryption to exchange that data. So the question is, how do we agree on this key value? How do I, at my browser, agree with a web server sitting who knows where on a symmetric key that we can use for our communication? Now, before we agree on an encryption scheme to use, let's take a look at some of the options out there. A very, very simple encryption scheme is something called a substitution cipher, where we're just substituting one thing for another. That monoalphabetic cipher I mentioned is just substituting one letter for another in the alphabet. So if our plain text is just our normal alphabet, A, B, C, D, all the way through Z, our cipher text will just be generated by substituting some letters for other letters. So A would map to M, B would map to N, C would map to B, etc. So our plain text, that might be Bob, period, I love you, period, Alice, would get transformed into the cipher text, NKN, dot space, S, and just this gibberish by just substituting those letters in. Our encryption key in this case would just be the mapping from the set of 26 letters to a set of the same 26 letters, just in different orders, right? So what we see right up here is our mapping from plain text to cipher text. Now, the problem we have with a simple monoalphabetic encryption is that it's very easy to break. I mean, I just have to try all the different combinations until I get something that makes sense. And on a computer, that's not going to take a whole lot of time to do. So let's take a look at a more sophisticated approach to using a monoalphabetic cipher that's maybe a little bit more secure. In this case, what we'll do is define n, just some number of substitution ciphers. We'll have m1, m2, all the way up to m n, all right, so we'll just have a whole bunch of different monoalphabetic ciphers, and we'll apply them in some cycling pattern that we decide on. So for example, if I've got four patterns, I might apply them in the order m1, m3, m4, m3, m2. Now for each new symbol, we'll just use the subsequent substitution pattern in that cycle. So for dog, D will get encrypted with the key from M1, zero from M3, G from M4, and so on and so forth. And we'll just keep looping around that cycle so that it's a little diff more difficult to crack. If I, as the attacker, don't know how many patterns there are, and what the cycling order is, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for me to analyze this message and try to figure out what the plain text is. So in this case, the encryption key is gonna be all N substitution ciphers and the cyclic pattern. Now that certainly makes things better for a monoalphabetic cipher, but it's still not gonna be that difficult to break. So moving forward, we have the DES or data encryption standard. And it consists of using a 56-bit symmetric key with 64-bit plain text input. Now we're not gonna get into the math on this one too much. We just wanna be aware of it kind of historically for the purposes of this class and figure out kind of how secure is this thing. Well, while there's no known good analytic attack that we can use to crack DES, there was something called the DES Challenge that was created by RSA Security, which was a contest to see how fast someone could brute force a DES encrypted phrase. And during one of those challenges, a 56-bit key encrypted phrase using DES was decrypted using brute force techniques in less than a day. So that is not great, right? We don't want something that's gonna be able to be broken that quickly. Now, one option to make DES more secure is something called 3DS, where we encrypt the plaintext three times with three different keys. So this is a lot like what we did with that monoalphabetic cipher in the last couple slides, right? We'll just do several different rounds of encryption. We'll cycle through some stuff. But even that didn't really meet our needs as computers just get more and more powerful and we're able to add more resources to trying to crack these encryptions.
So since we started having some problems with keeping DES secure, in 2001, something called AES, or the Advanced Encryption Standard, became the Symmetric Key NIST standard. It processes data in 128-bit blocks instead of the 64-bit blocks that DES used, and it can have 128, 192, or 256-bit keys. You might have actually seen reference to this out there in the world somewhere. If you uh, ever run across a notation uh, specifically talking about encryption, where you might have seen AES-128 or AES-256, that's what that means. It means that we're using the advanced encryption standard with, in the case of AES-256, a 256-bit key. So how much better is this? Did we really gain a lot? Well, to compare it to DES, a brute force decryption, which is just, again, trying each key, taking one second with DES, would take 149 trillion years for AES. So this is a huge improvement over DES. So that covers what we want to know for the purposes of this class about symmetric key cryptography. If you're disappointed that we didn't actually get into all the math on that, fear not, where we'll be covering that later on in the certification when we take a look at the web application security class. But moving on for now to public key cryptography, this is just a different approach. In symmetric key crypto, remember, we have to have the sender and receiver know that shared secret key. And our question that we asked was, how do we agree on that key in the first place? If I've never met you, I don't know you, I've never been to your server to get a web page, how am I going to agree with you on that symmetric key? Well, enter public key cryptography, which is a very, very different approach where the sender and receiver don't have the same secret key, right? We don't know that secret key. We have a public encryption key that's known to everybody and a private decryption key known only to the receiver. Let's go back to that same scenario we talked about earlier, where Alice wants to send Bob an encrypted message. But in this case, we'll see how that's gonna look using public key cryptography. Now, Bob has at some point generated both a public and a private key. We'll expand our notation about keys here just a bit. Uh, we'll still use K sub B for Bob's key, but we're gonna add these superscripts. So the plus means that we're talking about a public key and a minus means we're talking about a private key. So I'm just gonna to refer to this moving forward as Bob's public key or Bob's private key, et cetera, just to try to keep things a little bit more simple. So at some point, Bob will have given his public key out to Alice and the cool thing about public key encryption is it's okay if a whole bunch of other people get the public key as well. So when we think back to, hey, maybe Trudy's sitting there listening on that line somewhere, that's okay. Trudy can have Bob's public key. She can't actually read Alice's messages with it. And we'll get into exactly how that works in just a couple slides. So at some point, Bob has given out his public key and Alice has it. Alice will take her plain text message M, encrypt it with Bob's public key, and send that ciphertext again, encrypted with Bob's public key, over to Bob, who will use his decryption algorithm with his private key to decrypt it. The trick here is that neither Bob nor anyone else can decrypt a message that was encrypted with Bob's public key if all they have is Bob's public key. So even if Trudy steals that ciphertext and has Bob's public key, that doesn't matter. She will not be able to decrypt a message that was encrypted with that same public key. The only key that can decrypt the message is Bob's private key. So when Bob gets that message, he decrypts it with his private key and out pops the plain text message. So here's that expression we saw before. The original message can be obtained by taking that ciphertext that he got, which was just the message encrypted with his public key, decrypt it with his private key, and he has the original message. So this leads to a couple of requirements that we need for our keys to meet. So let's focus on Bob's keys for just a second. First of all, we would need a public key and a private key for Bob, such that if we take a message and we encrypt it with Bob's public key, 
We can then decrypt it with Bob's private key and get the original message back. And we have to have the key set up in such a way that given Bob's public key, it should be impossible to compute the private key that Bob has. All right, so we need these keys to be two different keys. And given the public key, we should be unable to compute the private key. And to solve this problem, we have the rivest shamir edelson algorithm, or RSA, which we use to this very day. When you SSH into a server, for example, you could use RSA key pair encryption to have a public key and a private key that allows you access to a server. Now, to take a look at how all this works, we're going to need to be familiar with some modular arithmetic. So x mod n is just going to be equal to the remainder of x when divided by n. Okay, so when you see x mod n, that's all that means. We're just going to divide x by n, and the remainder is what x mod n is equal to. Some facts about mod, and we won't worry about the derivations of these identities in this class. Well, actually, this uh, stuff we'll take a deeper look and get into the mathematics on in the Secure System Administration course, but we don't have to worry about it right now. We just do want to be aware of these identities and make sure that we're keeping them in mind for the quiz and the final, hint, hint, because you may need to go back and forth a little bit, so make sure you study these or print them out or make some notes, uh, but we do want to be aware that these are out there. So the first one here just says that if we have A mod N and B mod N, right? So we take A divided by N, take the, rem the remainder of that, that's what A mod N is. B divided by N, the remainder of that is what B mod N is. If we add those two together and take that result and mod n that, so take that result, divide that by n, the mod is the remainder, that's going to be equal to, it's the same thing as the quantity a plus b mod n. If we have a mod n minus b mod n, and then we take that and apply mod n to that result, it's the same thing as the quantity a minus b mod n, and a mod n times b mod n, the result of that mod n, is going to be equal to the quantity a times b mod n. So what that tells us is that the quantity a mod n raised to the power of d, then you take that whole thing, mod n, is equal to a to the power of d mod n. Let's take a quick example of that just to make sure that we're clear on it, because I know there's lots of mods flying around everywhere. So let's say we have some value x, which is 14, n is equal to 10, and d is equal to 2. x mod n to the d mod n is the same thing as saying 14 mod 10, which we divide 10 into 14, we get 1 with a remainder of 4, so that ends up being 4, d is 2, so 4 squared, mod n, which in this case where n is 10, so mod 10, we have 16 divided by 10, that's 1, with a remainder of 6. So the result of that whole thing is just 6. If we take a look at the other side of that identity, a to the d mod n, x to the d is 14 squared, right, which is 196. So 196 mod 10 is 19 with a remainder of 6, so that expression is equal to 6. So our identity holds. This is just an example of this identity working. So again, write these down, make sure you understand what mod means, and you might need to refer to these for tests moving forward, but this is about all the modular arithmetic you need right this moment. Again, we'll get into a lot more of this in the next classes on the computer science side of the certification. So as we get ready to dive into how RSA encryption works specifically, we want to keep a few things in mind. First of all, a message can be represented as just a bit pattern, right? We're talking computers, so no matter what the message ends up being when it gets all the way up to the application layer, however we're going to represent that message, we can always break it down into just a unique pattern of ones and zeros. All right, and that bit pattern can be uniquely represented by an integer number. Any pattern of bits can be translated 
from base 2 to base 10, giving us a decimal number. Thus, encrypting a message is equivalent to encrypting a number. So for example, if our message is 10010001, just this 8-bit binary number, that message can be uniquely represented by the decimal number 145. Right? We, all we have to assume is that we drop any leading zeros on that binary. We could have a million zeros off to the left before we get to the actual meat of the message. But if we drop those off, then that bit pattern will be uniquely represented by 145. To encrypt M, right? so to encrypt that bit pattern, we can encrypt the corresponding number, which gives us a new number, and that new number is our ciphertext. So let's take a look at creating a public-private key pair using RSA. Again, we won't get into all the deep math on this, but we want to see what the process looks like so we have an idea of what's going on behind the scenes. So the first thing we'll do is choose two large prime numbers, and we'll call those P and Q. Don't forget that a prime number just means some positive natural number greater than 1 that is only evenly divisible by itself and 1, right? So 7, for example. It's larger than 1. You can't divide it by, at least you can't divide it evenly by 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? You can only divide it evenly by 1 and itself. What do we mean when we say large? Well, for an example, let's take 1,024 bits each. So pretty, pretty long streams of bits. We'll compute n, which is going to be equal to p times q, right? We just chose those two large prime numbers, p and q. We'll call n the product of p and q, and we'll have z, which is p minus 1 times q minus 1. We'll choose some e that's less than n that has no common factors with z, all right? So basically, if we take all the factors of z and the factors of e, they won't have any in common. So when we have that, we call we say that e and z are relatively prime. Next, we'll choose some value d such that e times d minus 1 is exactly divisible by z, which is the same thing as saying that ed mod z is equal to 1. Remember that mod, again, means we would take ed, divide that by z, and the remainder would be the result of the mod operation, and so that would be 1. That's because if ed minus 1, if 1 less than that is exactly divisible by z, so that the remainder of ed minus 1 mod z ends up being 0, then 1 more, right, ed instead of ed minus 1 mod z would have a remainder of 1. Our public key will be the ordered pair n comma e, right? That's Bob's public key. We have the n that we've computed and the e that we've chosen. That'll be the public key. And the same n that we computed and that d that we chose will be the private key. Now, I know we're going through kind of a lot of math here, and it might seem a little confusing because, again, the underlying mathematics is pretty complicated in this. All we're trying to do here is get an idea of what the process looks like. So at this stage, don't worry too much about everything that's going on behind the scenes. This is the information that we want to be aware of moving forward. Uh, we'll get, again, deeply into the mathematics on this in future courses. So the point of everything we just went through was really just to choose three integers, right? That's all we've actually done here. We've gotten an N, an E, and a D out of all that math. Now, given those pairs, N and E, which define Bob's public key, and N and D, which define Bob's private key, now we're ready to encrypt and decrypt messages. So to encrypt a message M that's less than N, we'll compute c is equal to m to the e mod n. So our ciphertext, or c, is just the original message raised to the power of e. Remember, that's part of Bob's public key pair. Mod that with n. And then to decrypt that received pattern, c, right? That's what somebody's going to encrypt. Alice will encrypt her message for Bob using the 
his public key, right, that N and E, she'll encrypt that generating C or her ciphertext, which she'll send over to Bob. Then to decrypt that ciphertext that Bob receives, he'll compute the original message, which is equal to C to the D mod N, and magic has happened. When we feed our ciphertext into that equation, right, we just substitute C, which remember is M to the E mod N, take that whole thing to the power of D, then mod N, the result of that, we get our original message back. Let's take a quick look at an example of this whole thing in action, because we've, we've talked about a lot of relationships between various numbers, so let's put it all into context and see how they work together. And the big thing to remember about this is all we're doing is choosing some numbers so that they have certain relationships to each other, which are defined by what we just went over in the last couple slides. So let's say Bob chooses as his P and Q, and remember those P and Q are just prime numbers, right? He's gonna choose a couple prime numbers, and let's just choose five and seven to keep things simple. So in that case, remember N is equal to P times Q, so five times seven is 35, that's our value for N. Z is just equal to P minus one times Q minus one, so that's four times six, giving us 24. We'll choose E, right? That's gonna be one half of Bob's public key. And we'll choose that so that E and Z are relatively prime. So let's choose five because Z and E in that case, 24 and five, won't have any factors in common. And let's choose D. Now remember, ED minus one has to be exactly divisible by Z. So let's choose D to be 29. Uh, we can take a look at that and verify that. 29 times 5, or D times E, is going to be 145. Subtract 1 for that, we get 144, which is, in fact, evenly divisible by our value for Z, which is 24. 24 goes into that six times. So that's all we've done. The last couple slides, we're just choosing numbers so that they have certain relationships to each other. Once we have all that, now I've got N and I've got E, that gives me my public key, and I've got N and D, which gives me my private key. So I want to encrypt something with the public key. So let's say we're just gonna take a nice simple little bit pattern here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0. That equates to 12, right? Remember, we're gonna take a bit pattern and turn it into a number, so that bit pattern corresponds to the number 12. And let's just put it through those equations. M to the E, in this case, is gonna be 248,832. And then when we just substitute into that equation for the ciphertext, M to the E mod 35 ends up being 17. And you can verify that math on your own, but that's all we're doing is dividing M to the E, that 248,832, divide that by 35, the remainder ends up being 17. So now I've got my ciphertext, that 17 is my ciphertext. When Alice sends that over the wire, right, she's encrypted her message, which is 12, with Bob's public key and gotten 17, so she sends Bob that result. She sends the ciphertext. When Bob receives that, he's going to decrypt it using his private key. So he'll get that 17 in, C to the D, Right, 17 to the 29th is this big, huge thing down here. We won't worry about exactly what that is, but when we substitute that in, when we mod that by 35, we end up getting 12, which, oh hey, that is in fact the original message. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot that looks kind of clunky and weird and complicated, but this is all we're doing. It, it really is this simple. Now, if you're asking yourself, well, if it's so darn simple, Jason, why in the world does it work? That's a perfectly fair question. So this is where we pull out some of that modular arithmetic we talked about earlier. What we need to show is that C to the D mod N is going to equal M, where C is equal to M to the E mod N. And that's just that equation from a couple slides ago. So we have a fact, and this is just another one of those identities of modular arithmetic that we want to keep in mind, but we, we don't necessarily have to get into the derivation of. For any x and y, x to the y mod n is going to be equal to x to the y mod z mod n. 
right? So we just want to keep that identity in mind. And that holds when n is equal to p times q and z is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. So uh, now we're seeing where some of these uh, identities and some of these relationships that we've been talking about become important. So from that follows c to the d mod n is equal to m to the e mod n, that quantity raised to the power of d mod n, which now we just apply some of those identities that we had before to simplify this thing down. That is equal to m to the e d mod n, now remember, we chose E and D subject to some constraints, right? We chose E and D so that ED minus one mod Z would equal zero. In other words, so that ED minus one would be evenly divisible by Z, right? And that implies that ED mod Z is going to end up equaling one. So when we substitute that in here, we have m to the one mod n, and we've chosen p and q, and we've generated n such that m mod n is just going to be equal to m, and there we have it, there is our original message. Now, here's some more weird looking math. That's very, very useful though. This is something that's a hugely useful property, and what this basically says is that if we take a message, and we encrypt it with Bob's public key, and then we decrypt it with Bob's private key, we're actually gonna get our original message back. And we can actually go both ways with this. We can do it the other way around too. We can encrypt a message with Bob's private key, and then decrypt it with Bob's public key, we're still gonna get the original message back. Now, why is this important? Well, we've talked about this in the context of Alice wanting to send Bob a message. Right, so Bob gets Alice his public key, and she encrypts it with that, and then she sends him the ciphertext, which he then decrypts with his private key. This means, though, that when I generate a private public key pair, right, I'm going to have my public key and my private key. I can have access to both of those. This is where I can use this to, say, SSH into a server, like I mentioned before. I can go ahead encrypt something with my private key, send it off to something that has my public key, that system can use my public key to decrypt this thing that I encrypted with my private key. It can then do whatever I've asked it to do. When it wants to return a message to me, it can encrypt that message with my public key, send it back, and I can decrypt it with my private key. So this property allows me to generate a key pair just for my own use, so that's really useful, but why does that work, right? Why does that identity hold? Well, it follows directly from the modular arithmetic we've been using this whole time. m to the e mod d, that whole quantity to the power of d mod n is equivalent to m to the e d mod n, right? That's just from one of our identities from earlier. And that's equivalent to m to the d e mod n, which is equivalent because when we multiply two things, right, we can just flip them around. So m to the e d and m to the d e are the same thing. When we then apply that identity from the first one the other way around, that gives us m to the d mod n to the e mod n. So these two things are equivalent. It doesn't even take that much. We just use our identity, flip around those exponents in the direction that we're multiplying them, and then apply the identity again the other way, and we see that, yes, I can use a public and private key to decrypt each other's ciphertext, and I can go both ways with it. Well, now that we've slogged through all that math, why is this whole thing secure? I mean, that's the whole point of what we're talking about, so what makes RSA secure? Well, suppose you know Bob's public key. You know N, and you know E, how hard is it going to be to determine D, right? How hard is it going to be to get that other half of the private key? Well, essentially, we have to find factors of N without knowing the two factors P and Q, right? Because I don't know those. I was, I, if I'm the attacker, I might be able to get my hands on, I can get my hands on N maybe, and I might be able to get my hands on E, right? I can get Bob's public key whenever I want. But if I want to actually crack the whole communication channel, I have to determine D, 
Now, if I don't know the two factors, P and Q, that were used to generate E and D, that's going to be very, very difficult because factoring a big number is really, really hard. It's very computationally intensive. And we want to remember that when we talked about building a public-private key pair, we specify that we're going to choose two large prime numbers for P and Q, right? So maybe 1,024 bits each, maybe 2,048 bits or 4,096 bits, right? Then when we start multiplying these together to get our N's and Z's, well, we're getting things even larger. Really huge number here, and factoring those is extremely difficult. So what do we use this thing for in practice? Well, I've already mentioned a couple of times the use that we can get out of it by generating a public-private key pair for authentication with a server, for example. But something else to keep in mind is that the exponentiation that we've been talking about with RSA, right? We, we have all these things being raised to various exponents, and that's computationally intensive. Now, that's for an asymmetric approach, but with a symmetric key approach, we get a lot better speed. DES, for example, is at least 100 times faster than RSA. So what we can do is kind of set up a little hybrid kind of situation. We can use public key cryptography to establish a secure connection and then choose a second key, in this case, a symmetric session key for actually encrypting our data. So that session key would be that K sub S that we mentioned way back at the beginning of the video. Bob and Alice can use RSA to exchange a symmetric key. And then once they both have that symmetric key, they can use symmetric key cryptography. And we'll talk a little bit more about how this works practically when we talk about SSL. And that does it for section two. In our next video, we'll talk about message integrity.